I'll bet you've read them all, though. Hey, we're live, everybody. And we've got John Willis, Ken Berry, Nicole Sauce on to talk about whatever y'all want to talk about. So if you've got something you want us to cover, please put it in the comments in all caps. Let's start with you, Dr. Berry. Tell us a little bit about what's been going on, who you are, what's been going on the last couple of months in your in your world. Yeah, I'm Dr. Ken Berry, a family physician, been practicing family medicine for over 20 years, uh, wrote a book called Lies My Doctor Told Me, started a YouTube channel helping people understand the difference between bullshit nutrition and actual uh, proper human diet. And uh, that's and so we I'm also a, a budding learning um, romper room rancher. I've got some sheep and chickens. I'm, I'm going to get a couple of piglets and run them in the pasture this spring. Uh, maybe going to buy a few head of cattle this spring as well. That's kind of, and so I'm all about uh, what you eat matters. It matters more than probably 99% of the shit that you worry about. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you on today to talk about whatever anybody wants to talk about. John Willis, how's your week been going? I think everybody knows who you are on your own channels and they know who you are on my channels. We're good. It's a, it's a little cold outside, a little rainy. We got a lot of water standing on the ground. So we're, we're seeing some issues we need to correct, but nothing that can be corrected now. Um, everything's underway. Everything's put back together from the event this weekend. And um, somebody, somebody asked me, are you rested up? And I'm like, it, it's like it never happened. I didn't do the hard work. Nicole did. I'm sure Nicole still feels it. And we're just back to normal Monday. Yep. We're doing great here. So I'm Nicole Sauce. And I, I did the festival with John Willis and we got all unpacked. I did my last thing today, which is cleaning the last coffee maker out with vinegar so that it can all get stowed away. Cause we're going out of town next week again for another event. So we're pretty rested up actually. This one was a lower, like tired impact than the first, I think just cause it was the second one. Okay. But let's get back to nutrition. If we want to be prepared for what life is bringing mm -hmm. us, we cannot let our bodies go. And Dr. Barry has a pretty good story about he did, how he discovered that the U.S. Daily Recommendation diet dietary guidelines suck. Why don't you start by telling us about that? And guys, if you have questions along the way, just throw them in all caps in the comments. Yeah. So a, a few years, years into my medical practice, I got fat and pre-diabetic. And uh, John Willis probably remembers when I was a fat ass. And, and, you know, I was like, OK, so I'm going to start following the American Diabetes Association recommended diet because I'm fat and pre-diabetic. That makes sense. And I did that and I got fatter and more more pre-diabetic. And I'm like, well, OK, that obviously is not going to work for me. I got to find something else. And uh, during my reading of God, probably twenty five thousand hours of nutrition textbooks and nutrition articles and uh, books outside of mainstream medicine. I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, and then that took me down the archeology, span the anthropology and the paleoanthropology. And I, I have wound up with what I call a proper human diet now. And, you know, back in 2003, I've been, I've been in kind of the prepper survival, be prepared, Jack Spearco circle, for two, two, three decades, I've always been very interested in that and thought that was important. But I was the guy that would buy the prepackaged, you know, 40 meals in a big bucket for $200. <coughs> what I've come to realize is that there are two types of human diets. There's a diet that you eat to keep from starving to death, which, you know, there may be scenarios where that's very important. But there, then there's there's also a diet that you can optimize your function, both your physical and mental function. You can reverse chronic disease and you can be your best self. And I feel like in any kind of scenario that we all worry about, I don't want to just be limping by on a starvation diet. I, that's probably not going to serve me and my family very well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use all of that prepackaged high carb uh, survival food. I'm going to use that for barter. And for me and my family, we're going to have eggs in the hen house and sheep in the pasture and cattle in the pasture, pigs in the woods. That's what we're going to eat. But if you if you come to me starving, I'll happily barter with you and I'll trade you a can of 40, you know, MREs or whatever uh, for, you know, a firearm or whatever you have that I actually need. But as for me and my family, we're going to eat out of the pasture and out of the hen house. That's what we're going to eat because 
We want to optimize our health, not just limp by on a starvation diet. You know, somebody asked me the other day, how do you store for long-term storage a the kinds of foods that you eat on a proper human diet? Yeah. And I'm so, like, can store in it the way you need to right now, right? Yeah, in the pasture. That's where you store it. And and so, you know, as long as the electricity is working, you store it in the freezer. Uh, you can also always make jerky and biltong. There's a million different ways to preserve eggs. There's a million different ways to preserve meat and fat so that you have access to that no matter what comes around the corner. Uh, but as long as the lights are on, you know, we've got, we have uh, three deep freezers mm -hmm. right now full of, full of meat. So we're good. If the power goes off, I've still got meat stored in the pasture. Yep. And you can always can that stuff straight out of the freezer. If you don't have a Jenny to keep it going, if it's going to be a long time, power outage, you've got a good week usually to get that meat out of your freezer into the pressure canner and canned, and you can get a lot canned. You can have a big old barbecue, yep. whatever you need to do. That's what I always said years ago when people said, what are you going to do if you're de if the power goes out for the rest of, the of your life? I was like, well, I'm going to light a fire or use my propane and can yep. me some meat up because I eat meat. Okay. I, the prepared patriarch. Thanks for sharing that on your channel. Even if you quote unquote, only have 1300 subscribers. You'll gain another 20 or 30 today just from posting that right there. Right. So, guys, never feel bad about I can only do this. That means you did something. And I think when we talked to Dr. Barry about how to transition from a normal, normal American, traditional American diet of crap to eating whole foods, eating primarily meat based and eliminating grains and carbs from your diet people cannot conceptualize like, how am I going to get this done? And what about my kids? They eat Cheerios. You take a step, right, Dr. Barry? Yeah. And then you take a second step. Exactly. You have to be the parent. Yeah. yeah. And, and learn. <laughs> yeah. And so I would be a little more diplomatic than John. I usually am, but that's okay. <laughs> people love his style. But I would say to a parent, every, who buys the groceries? Who has the car keys? Who has the credit card and the checkbook? Every time you go to the grocery store, buy one more proper human diet food and forget to buy the Lucky Charms or forget the Ding Dongs or the Little Debbies or they're like, oh, shit, honey, I'm sorry. I forgot the Ding Dongs, but I did get some blueberries. I'll, I'll make you some head, head, you know, whipped, whipped cream to go on top. Every time you go to the grocery, make one better choice and then don't make one bad choice that you used to make. Yeah. And after a month of that, you will have painlessly effortlessly converted your entire household, your entire family to eating a predominantly proper human diet. And, and so what if your kids have a bowl of, of Cheerios every now and then? That's not that big of a deal, especially for kids. But on the daily basis, on a routine basis, you're going to feed them meat and eggs. That's what they're going to eat. And, and so a little veg if they want it, some nuts if they want it, some berries if they want it. But the bulk of your diet, the majority of your kid's plate ultimately should be covered with meat and eggs, fatty meat and eggs. And that's what's going to give them their best health and protect them, arm them against obesity and fatty liver and diabetes and prediabetes and all the bad things that come from eating an inflammatory high carbohydrate diet. Yep. And of course, we have the question from Rachel, suggestions on coffee types when you're trying to eliminate sugar. sugar. Obviously, the answer is by holler roast, but... Seriously, if somebody is used to having a sweetened beverage or sweetened coffee, what steps can they take to retrain their palate, you know, outside of obviously buying holler roast to yeah, always buy holler roast. And always not, buy holler roast. First right? of all, it's not hollow roast. It's hollow. OK, <laughs> and it, it's holler roast. That's what it is. And uh, I've got a link in all my YouTube lives, I think, to your coffee yep. uh, because it's, it's really that good. And I trust you. I know you. I've met you. I've been to your place. I know that you're a real, you're true blue. You're not going to, you're not going to cut corners. And that's, I don't like people who cut corners. And so I, st I used to, I used to have a little coffee with my coffee mate, you know, like the, the strawberry shortcake coffee mate or whatever. This is the shittiest, sugariest one. But that, literally I would have this much coffee and this much bullshit. Uh, and so my evolution over the years is now I'm drinking right now, black coffee with a little bit of butter. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. what I'm drinking. 
I haven't put sweetener in my coffee for, I don't know, five years. I just, I literally, if you gave me a cup of sweet coffee, I couldn't even drink it. And so I think that stevia, monk fruit extract, all the, the, the non-nutritive sweeteners, that helps a ton of people to break the sugar habit. They still got the sweet taste, but they're not getting all the, the, the sugar and carbs. And then after you've gotten used to that, then you're going to start to wean down that sweetener until you're just not using it anymore. And then I'll, I, I'm going to go uh, John Willis on everybody and say, hey, you're a grown ass human. Grow up. OK, you don't need dessert coffee. Shut up. Get the sugar out of your coffee. Yeah. Okay? But you can you don't have to do that overnight. You can wean that down and switch to, to stevia for a month or two and then wean down the stevia, and then you're just drinking actual coffee. And Nicole will tell you that if you put too much sweetener in your coffee, you're going to mask a lot of the, the under flavors and the back flavors of the coffee. You're missing out. Real quick. And as you Ken, transition, Ken, go ahead, John. Ken, um, N3 uh, QDZ, his name's Matt. That's a, a friend of mine. He just got out of the hospital with diverticulitis, and they have pumped him full of all kinds of information that is completely yep. contrary to what you have told Amanda and myself. Can yeah. you just touch on that for a minute? Yeah, so uh, N3QDZ, you guys got to all change your handles to something. For <laughs> just just call him Matt. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm sure your doctor told you to avoid nuts and seeds. This is total bullshit. Uh, I, you go to my YouTube video about diverticulitis. I have one, one or two dedicated just to that. There's a huge medical study that was done years ago that shows definitively that nuts and seeds and, and strawberries with seeds and blackberries with seeds has literally nothing to do with diverticulitis, has no effect, does not cause diverticulitis. The things that increase your risk of having a diverticulitis flare up are smoking, being overweight, highly processed foods, and for people who are eating keto, the nut flours, I don't, even if you're, in, you know, almond flour and coconut flour are less bad than wheat flour. But if you have diverticulosis, the nut flours are going to increase your risk of having a diverticulitis flare. Nuts and seeds have nothing to do with diverticulitis. They're not going to cause it. Red meat has literally nothing to do with it. It's, it's going to protect you from having flare ups of diverticulitis. Probably 99% of the, the recommendations your doctor gave you about diet were dead wrong. Watch my videos. And, and for all you guys, the in every one of my videos, if there's some contentious thing I'm talking about, look down in the show notes. The research that I based my video on is, is in the show notes. This is not just my opinion. I woke up and scratched my butt and thought, yeah, I guess I'll just say that today. This is all based on research. And so, yeah, eat your nuts and seeds if you like them but definitely eat your fatty red meat. Yep. I'm glad we went down that way. Back to getting sweetening out of your, your world. What I have just, I realized I had a sweet, an addiction to sweet flavors at some point in my journey. And I cut them all out, like no fake sweeteners, no, no real sweeteners, no honey, nothing for about two months. And then when I went back, to try something with sweetener in it, it was disgusting. Yep. Part of it is retrain, decide to retrain your palate. Mm -hmm. Like this weekend, we talked a lot about getting the right mindset. When you decide to like coffee or tea without milk or whatever, without sweetener, when you decide to do that and try it for a little while, you retrain your body, you retrain the, 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 the flavor receptors on your tongue. And next thing you know, you like how cheese tastes without sugar added or cheese. I can make cheesecake yep. with eggs and cream cheese and nothing else and a little bit of vanilla. And I'm totally happy with it. Absolutely. People, uh, grown adults believe the stupidest things. And it's not really our fault that we believe these things, but it is our problem. And one of the, the false beliefs that the majority of adults have is that, Okay, I like the following foods. I don't like these foods. And that can never change. And that's, mm -hmm. that's completely wrong. You can absolutely, as you cut the carbs and sugars out of your diet, and Nicole and John can both attest to this, you will actually learn to like new things. And you'll try things you've never tried. And you're like, holy shit, I actually like that. I, I, I never dreamed I would like that. And also, you, you, you can train your palate to detect very subtle 
non-sweet tastes when you get the sugar out of your mouth. And so I, I, one of the best ways that you can know that you're keto adapt, adapted or you've adapted to being in ketosis is when you can start to taste the sweetness in almonds and cashews and you mm -hmm. eat it, you know, and so if anybody's like almonds aren't sweet, what's he talking about? You're not, you're not keto adapted. And once you get that way, you'll actually go, oh yeah, I can taste the, I can literally taste the sweetness in this raw or roasted almond. That's how you know that your, your, your palate is actually waking up and growing up because grown men and women don't need sugar in their diet. Sugar's for babies. Yep. Okay. We've got a question from Karatali. I can't, I hope Karatali. I said that right. What are your thoughts of HCG's supplements to help with a calorie deficit to, to help with weight loss? Yeah. Complete and utter waste of money. Uh, and then also you're believing a false paradigm that you have to be in a calorie deficit to burn stored fat, which is absolutely not true at all. Uh, and, and a lot of people just have, ex they've accepted, oh, I have to be in a calorie deficit, just like they've accepted gravity, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the calorie deficit is a hypothesis. It's never, ever been shown to be true. Got multiple videos about that on my YouTube channel. Eat as much fatty meat and eggs, including the yolk, as you can, eat until you're comfortably stuffed and then get up and walk away from the table. Don't snack between meals. Eat one or two or even three meals a day in a, in a time-restricted window, and you'll start to burn stored fat immediately. Yep. So the, the HCG thing, Cardi, I don't know how that would even is supposed to work. I would assume that it's supposed to suppress your appetite. I inject HCG as much as I can get, and I yep. eat all the time. It does not make me not hungry. That's right. all some mumbo jumbo. Nothing's in, until you change what goes in your mouth and, and you move, none of that's going to, it's not going to yep. make any difference. There's and many not doctors, if it was, I would eat them. Yeah. Many doctors promote the HCG diet. And so that you get your HCG injection and then you eat 700 calories a day. And it's like, yeah, that's a starvation diet. You're going to, you're going to burn fat and lose weight on that. No doubt about it. But can you keep doing that forever? If your answer is, well, no, then as soon as you go back to your old diet, you're going to gain all the weight back and plus 10 more pounds. That's in, that's not even a solution. That's a temporary Band-Aid until you can get your mind right and start eating a proper human diet. That's in no way a permanent solution. Okay. We got one here from Amy Dingman, who you will meet in April at my workshop. Does keto carnivore change as you age? This way of eating is not new to me, but the older I get, the more tired or drained I get on very low carb. I, so I don't think it changes for any age from uh, a baby that's one minute old to a man or a woman that's 120 years old. You're still a human being by definition. And therefore, by definition, you should eat a proper human diet. And now my spectrum of a proper human diet is somewhere between as close to zero grams of total carbs a day as you can get all the way up to a hundred total grams a day of carbs that are real actual food carbs that grew in the dirt, right? The, no, no carbohydrates should ever come from a factory. That's by definition processed and is going to cause inflammation and going to cause fat storage. Uh, but if, if you want to get up to a hundred grams a day of broccoli and blueberries and, and almonds and cashews, I think that's perfectly fine. Some people maybe do better with, with more carbs, than other people. I personally do best as close to zero carb as I can get. That's where my body fat percentage, my energy, my mental health, all that stuff is optimal when I'm as close to zero carb as I can get. But I don't think that's necessarily true for everybody. Some people may need 20, 30, 50, 75 total grams of carbs a day to feel their best based on their hormone status, based on their genetics, where their, their people came from in the world, uh, based on their, their, uh, age. Yeah. All those things I think matter, but never, ever think, oh, I need to eat, you know, more than hundred total grams a day, or I need to eat wheat or I need sugar. All that's, all that's bullshit. A good rule of thumb for Ken's carbs is one ingredient. If, right. if you're eating carbs, there should only be one ingredient there. And yep. It shouldn't come from the middle of the store, right? So it's not in a plastic wrapper. It's on the outside of the store when you first yep. walk in the store and yep. it's a single ingredient. Yep. Outer aisle, one, and and basically no ingredient label. If it has an ingredients list, that's not a proper human diet food. Uh, broccoli doesn't come with an ingredients list. Ribeye, no ingredient list. Eggs, no ingredient list. 
Those are real human foods. But if you've got a, a, a label that's got ingredients and it's got more than three to five ingredients, that's not that's not that's not what you're looking for. Even the, if it says keto on the front of the package. <laughs> OK, that 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 typically means you should not eat that if it says keto on the front of the package. Yeah. Keto snacks. That's yeah. keto. The term keto now on packaging is right up there with organic and 100%. fat free. Twizzlers yeah, and are fat free. free. Yeah. yeah. Or sugar free. I like that one. I like yeah. the sugar free one. Yeah. Yep. OK, we have this from Chuck. I'm a type one diabetic resulting from hospitalized for four months from necrotizing fasciitis. Mm. Sepsis, multi-systemic organ failure. A1C is way down. How can I get off insulin for good? Diet? Question mark. Yeah. So, Chuck, you're almost certainly not a type 1 diabetic. You're a type 2 diabetic who's currently on insulin. Uh, as you lower your carbohydrate intake, you'll be able to quickly lower the amount of insulin you need. And uh, you'll be off insulin in just a few weeks. Work with your doctor on this. I've got somebody at the door. You guys take over. I'll be right back. All right. John, what do you want to talk about today? Well, whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> you know what kept happening when we put pictures up from Self-Reliance Festival last weekend? People kept sending us more pictures. Yes. I, I didn't know what was happening. How can I come? Why wasn't I there? Oh, yeah. I missed so much. Should How I did you going? not hear about it, guys? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got one for you right here. A custom fab here. I know, yeah. I know Richard there. He said, Beth message for long-term coffee storage. All right. So the best way to store coffee long-term if you want premium coffee that tastes great is unroasted as green coffee beans in a cool moisture free environment. But that means you have to learn how to roast coffee. And that's not exactly probably what you're asking. I will also say this. If you're going to store hollow roast coffee for 20 years, you are wasting your money. The whole point of, of reaching out to a craft roaster and getting freshly roasted coffee is that it'll be less, it'll be less than, six months old, which is about the minimum for grocery store coffee, even if it's something like Starbucks, right? Because they've shipped it all over the place. So my thoughts on long-term storage of coffee is if you want it to taste kind of good, get whole beans, decide if you want to buy a premium coffee and store it for a long time, or if you don't, and it's really just a backup plan, get something that may be kind of a shitty flavor, not the premium stuff and put it aside and resign yourself to, we're probably never going to use this coffee. But I think longer term, if we're, we're, we're prepping for end of world scenario, relationships are what matter. If, if you're worried about filling your coffee need, have a relationship with people who can get coffee. Because even if the world ends and coffee's not shipping from South America here, for a little while, we're going to figure that out because coffee is delicious. And because coffee is delicious, there's demand for coffee. And because there's demand for coffee, people want to exchange for coffee. And so really plan to get over a year or two without coffee, but we're going to get coffee back. If we can figure out how to get coffee in during the Civil War, we can figure out how to get in coffee in in a more modern society where there's some sort of breakdown. And if the, if the power goes out, right, if the power really goes out, never comes on and you're not drinking coffee, if it's not available. Right. Nobody's, nobody's going to give a shit. I have a thousand pounds of Starbucks coffee in yeah. five gallon buckets. It's a lot of buckets, guys. I'm not going to care if I've got to grind that up when nobody has coffee. And the dude that's bringing me whatever to trade, he's not yeah. going to care either. Right. And then when I buy coffee, I buy only, and it's getting harder and harder to find it in metal containers. I try to buy everything that we store in metal containers if I'm buying coffee and you can still get them at Costco and you can find them on the shelf at Walmart also. It's shitty coffee, but if, if nobody has coffee, you're not going to care. Yeah. Okay. Is there a natural remedy to lower heart rate and blood pressure? Dr. Barry, this one's for you, clearly. Yeah. So the most common form of high blood pressure or hypertension is essential hypertension which means that doctors don't really know why you have it. You just have it. So here's some high blood pressure pills to take. Well, the truth of the matter is, as I uh, show in my YouTube videos, hypertension, if it's essential hypertension, is caused 100% of the time by hyperinsulinemia. What causes high insulin? Too many carbohydrates in your diet. 
And the way you test for hyperinsulinemia is you have your doctor to check a C peptide and a fasting insulin. Most doctors don't have any damn idea what those tests are or how to order them or what they mean, but you can teach your doctor. And so once you're, you're eating low carb enough that your C peptide and fasting insulin and hemoglobin A1C are all normal, your blood pressure is going to either be back to normal or almost back to normal. So I've, I've had at this point, thousands and thousands of people reach out to me and say, hey, I used to be on three or four blood pressure medicines every day. But now that I'm eating the way you recommend, I've either a stopped all my blood pressure medicines and my blood pressure is beautiful, or I'm on a very low dose of one blood pressure medicine and my blood pressure is beautiful. And I used to be on four medicines. That That is without exception, the feedback I get from people who adopt a very low carbohydrate, ancestrally appropriate proper human diet is that my blood pressure either returned completely to normal or 99% to normal. So if you've got high blood pressure and you're taking pills for that, you're eating too many carbohydrates for your personal physiology. Absolutely. Okay. Here's one. How does erythritol qualify as zero sugar? Yeah. It's so great... different. Huh? <laughs> right. It's got an OL at the end. So that's a great question. And I, love, <laughs> I love this whole community because People in this community think about shit, and that's good. You're like, wait a minute. So anytime you see a sweetener that has OL as the last two letters, that's a sugar alcohol. And he's, his question is, is a very smart question because they're not zero calorie. They do. And so one of the great examples is maltodextrin, which is not a sugar alcohol, but, it, but it's in virtually every uh, package in the middle of the store. It's not zero calorie. It is literal sugar. Um, Splenda literally has sugar calories in it. Okay. But if, so the federal law is, is if one serving has less than five calories of sugar, you can say it's zero calorie and you can say it's sugar free. That's the federal law on this. And you're like, what the, what? Yeah, hundred percent. And, and so, there's ten servings in the little package. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. Why, that's why the serving. little servings are so small, right. right? And so, yes, sugar alcohols do have some calories because the first thing your body does is it knocks that OH group off and turns it back into a sugar. That takes some energy to knock the OH off, and so it, you're not going to get four calories of carbs per serving. You might get one or two or three calories of carbs from a serving of any of the sugar alcohols. Uh, but you're, you're, he's exactly right. You're, they, they still are going to convert at least to some degree to sugar once your body starts to digest them. The worst of all is the one that the American Diabetes Association used to love, which is sorbitol. And they used to put that in all the diabetic cakes and pies and candy. And it literally has like 3.8 calories of sugar per uh, gram and sugar itself has four grams or four calories per gram. So it's literally, it was not helping the diabetics at all. But remember the little candy packages used to have ADA approved on them. Yep. yep. Uh, acting like sorbitol was somehow magic. And it's the worst sweetener of all, of all the sugar alcohols. But, but uh, erythritol, xylitol, all of them have some few calories uh, that, that come from carbs. Exactly right. Good question. All right. All right. Barry, if I could only grow four foods, including animals, what would the four foods be? Sheep, cattle, pigs, chickens, or quail. <laughs> so <laughs> you'd ask the question, has all those. That's it. But any any ruminant, you got to have a ruminant in the pasture, whether it's cow, sheep, goat. Uh, people think, oh, I'll just buy a 270 and I'll hunt if the shit hits the fan. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you a story that my grandmother told me who is 91 and lived through the great depression. And this was in Hohenwald, Tennessee. This was not in some wow. metropolitan area. This was in the deep, deep woods. She said that at the end of the depression, it wasn't even worth going fishing in any of the local creeks or rivers. They were fished out and you might, you might go hunting and you might get a squirrel, but as far as rabbit deer, any other kind of bigger game, they were hunted out. And so that's back when we had a, the woods were much, much bigger back then. And there were many, many fewer people back then. 
So if, if your survival strategy is I'm going to get a 243 and go hunting, that's going to work for probably a month or two. And then you can forget that because you'll be you'll be shooting chipmunks and and you know little tiny shrews because all the big game will be gone in just a few months. Because how many how many guns were sold during the whole virus thing? Everybody's got a gun in a closet full of ammo, and they all think, "Oh, I'm going to supplement you know my diet with venison and and wild boar." That shit will be gone in a month or two. So uh, if that's your strategy, no, get some chickens, get some quail, get some sheep, goats, cattle, get some protein and fat in the pasture or in the hen house, or get a little quail hutch. I mean, in one corner of your garage, you could literally raise two or 300 quail and have and have 200 quail eggs a day, and you can feed them your table scraps. And also you can grind up all those MREs that you have and feed those to the quail and actually get some good nutrition out of the quail carcass and the quail egg. And Tell if you're going to grow grain, you can grow it to feed the animals that eat the grain. 100%. Tell them why they need a ruminant. So ruminants have a multi-chamber stomach. They're not like monogastric animals like pigs and chickens and humans. They actually are able to, you can feed them pretty much just shit, just grains and, and corn and just crap that's inflammatory. The bacteria in their multi-chamber stomach is able to actually break that stuff down and, and, and even if you're feeding them a terrible diet, they're still able to produce a pretty darn good food, which is by definition, what's the definition of food? Not something that keeps you from dying, but something that, that, that nourishes you, that helps your body heal and grow and improve. That's what the definition of food is. So you can feed cows wheat, corn, rice, oats, all that crap that, that inflame us and make us fat. And it's not going to be ideal for them because they're they're designed to be, eat grass, but they can still eat that junk and turn that into uninflammatory, uh, healthy protein and healthy fat. That's the difference between ruminants. Whereas if you feed pigs a shitty diet, it's still eating pig meats way the hell better than eating Cheetos or Ding Dongs. But it, they're they're not able to get rid of the the toxins and the inflammatory stuff as well as the the, the multi chamber stomach animals, the ruminants. And the ruminants will put the, the stuff that comes out the other end of the ruminant will build your soil to a level that you can't like you just can't do it without. It. Otherwise, it's chemical. And when you yep. do chemical, you always have plus the ruminants with yep. their feet in the soil. They're just constantly working that soil. There's so many benefits to having ruminants on your. your I don't care if you're far, if, if by farm you mean half an acre. There are so many benefits to having uh, ruminants on your on your property. Literally, we could talk about just that for hours. And we may want to at some point. Okay, I'm 5'10", 200 pounds, active daily, diagnosed with fatty liver and hypothyroidism. Suspect this is wrong. Will starting carnivore, with starting carnivore, what is the time frame to see improvements in diagnosis? Yeah, so you're going to start to see an improvement in the fatty liver in days. Okay, and I just I just put up a YouTube video with a study that shows that within three days, you've substantially reduced the amount of fat in your liver if you have fatty liver disease. Uh, and so we, for most people, within a few weeks to a, a few months, your fatty liver is completely gone. And most mm -hmm. doctors don't even know you can reverse it, but it's one of the fastest things that, that your body can reverse when you start eating a meat and egg heavy proper human diet. The hypothyroidism you may, you're most likely going to improve it and wind up being able to take a lower dosage, but that's something that you may be stuck with for, for life. Uh, very few people with hypothyroidism are able to come off their medicine completely, but it's very, very common for somebody with hypothyroidism when they adopt a proper human diet to be able to cut their dosage in half or more. They just don't need as much thyroid hormone replacement. Awesome. Okay, we got one here from Travis. Currently on HRT with levels around 900. Last couple of weeks, I've been really sluggish. Is it diet or something else? Yeah, it's probably diet. It, I'm assuming Travis is talking about his total testosterone. Yeah, it would have to I mean, be. A level of 900 is a very good level for a guy. Uh, you know, me and John, our level's 1,200. I mean, just look at us, right? But I want to uh, 2,000. 2,000. Oh, that's okay. I got you. But that's a good level. 
And so there's got, it's not your testosterone. Now, so what ha- there's multiple things that happen if you're eating a high carbohydrate inflammatory junk diet. One of the things is you're going to convert a lot of that testosterone to estrogen, right? That's a big deal. You do not want to be doing that. Some people take a second pill when they're doing TRT in order to keep that from happening. But one of the most natural ways and also the cheapest way to do it is to just start eating a proper human diet. So it probably is diet, Travis. But uh, if you convert to carnivore and your uh, fatigue is not much better in just a few weeks, go back and see your doctor because uh, I have to preface all my answers with the human body is very complex. It could be something else, right? But 99% of the time, Yes, it's the diet. Here's a good one. Got one kidney left, and my doctor said I can't go all protein. Therefore, I can't go keto, question mark. Yeah, Mary, I agree. You don't need to eat an all protein diet. In, in fact, that would that I don't, I've never recommended that. But you do need to eat a diet that, that has adequate amounts of protein. Uh, for most humans, one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight is the minimum that I would recommend. That's even for somebody with one kidney or, or who has terrible chronic kidney disease, protein is not bad for your kidneys. That is a myth. That is not true. Many doctors still believe that myth, but even back in 2003, when I first heard a nephrologist say that, I sent one of my patients back to me. I'm like, how does that even make sense? And I Googled that back in 2003. No, I probably did an info seek right? Because there was no Google. Uh, but but it, even then, there were multiple articles about how that's a myth. That's not true at all. And they would be like, I don't know why doctors keep saying this, because there's no research to support that. Where did that come from? But it's, a, it's one of those medical myths that just will not die. Protein is good for your kidneys. Fat is good for your kidneys. The thing that kills your kidneys is too many carbohydrates and too many inflammatory foods. And so w- one way you can prove this to yourself is uh, when I was a kid, there was maybe a dialysis clinic in Nashville and Memphis, maybe Knoxville. There was three in the whole state of Tennessee. Now, literally every tiny town in Tennessee, there's a check cash in place, there's a convenience store, there's a funeral home, and there's a dialysis clinic. Why? Is it because everybody's been eating keto and carnivore the last 30 years? No, it's because we've been eating all the highly processed, high carbohydrate junk food. That's what kills kidneys is a high carbohydrate diet. Developing prediabetes or type 2 diabetes or hyperinsulinemia, that's what's going to destroy your kidneys. So if any of you guys listening have any degree of chronic kidney disease, or you have just one kidney, then you want to protect your remaining kidney function like gold. And you're going to do that by eating a very low carbohydrate diet that's full of natural, ancestrally appropriate one ingredient foods, including meat and eggs. They are going to protect your kidney, not hurt it. Here's a good one. And we haven't really talked about exercise much in, I think, in any of our live streams that we've done. So how how important is daily exercise to yeah. our long-term health? Oh, it's very important. But And so I don't talk about exercise a lot because of my large part of my audience is trying to lose fat. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to burning fat and losing fat, losing weight, Exercise sucks. It's not going to help you at all. All the gym owners are lying to you, okay? Uh, John Willis has a home gym to build those guns that you see. That's that's what extra, That's what lifting weights is going to do, is going to make your muscles and your bones stronger, which have hundreds of health benefits, if not thousands. It's very, very good for you to exercise, to be in good shape, to be fit but it's not going to help you lose fat. That's a myth. That's not going to work. And so, oh my God, everybody in this space, if you're not physically fit and eating a proper human diet, then you're basically fooling yourself and blowing smoke. That's what you're doing. If you're not in good physical condition and you're not eating real human food, you're a, you're a poser at this point, basically. Collectors. Sorry, offended anybody. And, and if you are a poser and don't want to be, Change your diet and start going on a walk once a day right today. away, right? Start today. Yeah, get out those two cans of cream corn because you're not going to eat that shit. 
start doing some curls and some, yeah. I mean, you know, start, you got to start somewhere Yeah. and you, you can start today. 100%. Okay. How fast could a person reverse type two diabetes on carnivore or low carb? Yep. Somewhere between two months and 12 months, your type two diabetes will be completely gone depending on several factors. Uh, I've got an entire playlist on my YouTube channel about type two diabetes. If you implement everything I talk about, then every three months when you check your A1C with your doctor, it's going to be substantially lower. And somewhere between the sixth and the twelfth month, you're going to have a normal A1C. And then you'll you'll officially not be a type 2 diabetic anymore. And congratulations in advance. And also you're welcome in advance. And you did a documentary on that too, right? How do people find that? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure. It's called Reversed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's on a couple of the smaller networks. I actually uh, flew to Costa Rica and spent a week with four type two diabetics. And just in the the seven days, one of the diabetics who was on a huge amount of insulin was able to come completely off her insulin in seven days. And all of them, their blood sugar started coming down. We had to start stopping uh, diabetes medication left and right so that they didn't get low blood sugars. It, it starts to happen very quickly, especially if you're on insulin as a type two, you're going to come off the insulin in a week or two or three max. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Okay. We have questions specific to thyroid. What about supplementing with uh, Lugol's iodine for folks with thi- thyroid issues? Yeah. Uh, I, Lugol's is a, a big deal. I discovered it God, 25 years ago. And uh, I read a book by Dr. David Brownstein, and he talked about how iodine deficiency is endemic. Literally, the average person doesn't have enough iodine in their diet or in their body. And I thought, well, that would be that's convenient. Let me look into that. And when you start looking at the research, you're like, no, it's totally true. And so I started supplementing with uh, two drops of Lugol's 2% 20 years ago, a long damn time ago. And so what people have to understand is that if there's not iodine in the soil, then you can eat, uh, I don't care what the USDA, like you look it up, the nutrition facts, and it says, oh, it's got this much iodine. If there was no iodine in the soil that the broccoli grew in, there's no iodine in the broccoli. Same goes for cows and pigs and chickens. If there's no iodine in the soil, you ain't getting no iodine. I don't care what the chart says. OK, and so the further you live from a, an ocean coast, the less and less iodine there is in the soil. And the reason we started to put iodine in salt as a country was back uh, during the beginning of World War One. They found out that they really couldn't draft any young men from Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, anywhere up there because they all had a gorder because they were deficient in iodine. So all those boys were getting 4F because they had a gorder and they wouldn't draft them. And so they're like, shit, we're, we're missing out on thousands of boys that we could turn into cannon fodder because they have a gorder. So they said, how are we going to fix this? And they came up with the solution of putting iodine in salt because everybody used salt. I'd, a salt is a terrible way to get iodine for many, many reasons. So either eat iodine-rich seafood, and I've got a YouTube video about iodine-rich foods, surprisingly. <laughs> or uh, my, uh, I designed this mineral drop with Keto Chow called Keto Chow Daily Minerals. It has 500 micrograms of iodine in every serving. And so you can get it that way. Or you can use Lugol's 2%. Use one drop or two drops a day. That's all you need. But you've got to have iodine. And people think, oh, that's all about the thyroid. It's actually every cell in your body has to have iodine in order to function optimally. Without it, we've never found a human cell that when we studied it, it didn't have an iodine symporter that pulls iodine into that cell. Now, thyroid tissue and mammary gland tissue and salivary tissue, they concentrate it much more. That's true. But every cell in your body needs iodine in order to function optimally. If any doctor argues with that, then print out the studies in my iodine videos and say, here, dude, Stop saying stupid shit. Read this. The entire endocrine system has to do with iodine. And they say that bromine, fluoride, chlorine, all the things in your water right now yep. block the uptake. And that's why people have so many problems. So you guys need to be filtering your water and drinking Perfect. clean water too. Like yep. in California, any municipality over 10,000 has to have fluoridated water by law. So you think, okay, I'll drink bottled water to get around that. 
No, you won't, because all the bottled water also has to have fluoride in it. They are poor. There's a there's a there's a uh, a YouTube video called Poisoning Our Water. I have shared it probably 20 times. It stays up for about a week and then it disappears. But if you can find that, it is well worth watching that documentary. And it's really easy to filter water. Yep. Super yep. easy. Absolutely. Either distillation or reverse osmosis is usually what it takes to get uh, fluoride out of the water. Uh, I think uh, Berkey filters, they do have a filter that will filter out fluoride. But fluoride is such a small thing that it's it, like if you've just got a, a tap filter, that's not going to do it. And John may remember back in, I think it was 2012 or 2013 when I – I uh, moved the Camden, Tennessee city council to take fluoride out of the Camden water supply. And so unless they yeah. snuck around and put it back in, it's not. Uh, that was a, that was a front page story back in, I don't know, 2013 in the Camden Chronicle. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of. And of course there were dentists coming in saying, well, there's going to be an epidemic of cavities and dental abscess. And I'm like, well, okay, you guys start count counting right now. And when you show me the spike in, in cavities and dental abscesses, I'll come back and I'll, I'll have the city council put it back in the water. But to this day, how many years ago was that, John? I still haven't heard from those dentists. And there's not a there's not a machine on most of these small municipalities and stuff like an IV drip. They don't have that. It's a bag. Mm -hmm. They sit across two bars and they jam some pencils in it and it pisses in the water like yep. it is insane. If yep. you look at where it comes from, it is a byproduct of manufacturing aluminum and United States and China. And I think UK are the only countries that don't export it completely out of their country. They feed it to their people. It used to be a big, huge cost to get rid of it. And they had some guys um, under employment of Alcoa that pushed all this forward. And now all of a sudden they're able to sell it instead of have to pay to dispose of it. Yep. And what, what John just said for many of you guys, especially if you're new to this way of thinking, you're like, well, that's a big fat conspiracy theory, but yeah. uh, just start looking into it and you'll find that all the, all that and more is 100% true and documented. Yeah. It's funny how that works with conspiracy theories. Cause every time I hear one, I'm like, okay, now I got to go research it. Cause I want to verify because sometimes like, I really don't think the earth is flat, for example. Um, but you know, I hear it and I always get this unfocused look on my face because I'm like, damn it, now I gotta go look it up again and see what's really going on there. But it, it's worth digging into those things and it's worth questioning. If somebody tells you something that's a conspiracy theory, the first question you should ask yourself is, is this possible? Is this possible? If the answer to that question is yes, then you might as well go look and see because it might also be happening. Yep. But a lot conspire. of us are trained to just like, nope, that's not happening. Con conspire means to breathe together. The rawest root of the word, it means yep. to breathe together. Yep. Conspiracy theory is a term that was coined by our CIA and put forth to manipulate. Like every, <laughs> every Hollywood movie has a CIA guy. There is an office for the Central Intelligence Agency in Hollywood that all of these movies get screened through and then they manipulate them how they want to. Well, we don't have to do that, right? Well, no, you don't, but you'll never use any military equipment in any of your movies if you don't. They're, they're all bought. It's all bought and paid for. Yep. And let me say this. This is an unpopular opinion about conspiracy theories, I think. But if you all the mainstream media, they're mortified that you might read an article about, you know, that's written by a conspiracy theorist, like, like it's some kind of infectious virus that if you read that, that's it. Your, your brain is screwed for life. But I actually think that conspiracy theories are excellent brain exercise, even the dumb ones. Like I remember when the flat earth thing got popular again, mm -hmm. years back, I dug way down into that because I think we should all question everything, at least to some degree. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure the damn earth is round, but I'm going to, I'm going to play, I'm going to go along with this. And I, and I dug deep into it and it was excellent. It was fun. It was invigorating mentally to hear these arguments and be like, well, how am I going to disprove that? That's, that sounds very compelling. And so still to this day, I did not die and I do not believe the earth is flat. Uh, but it was, it was so much fun. And I think it was uh, mentally invigorating to listen to the arguments and be like, okay, how is that wrong? How's that argument wrong? 
I think that's great brain exercise. And I'm, I'm not afraid of conspiracy theories at all. If you're truly trying to think about your world and try to distill out what's really true and what's really not true, I think you have to entertain some of these because as John implied, many of the mainstream uh, narratives uh, are when you start looking for facts to support them, you're like, um, that might be a conspiracy theory, even though it's on MSNBC or Fox News. I I think that may be a conspiracy theory because I can't prove that. People don't realize that the, the news that you watch, mainstream media, those are news readers. They don't, they don't research any of that. People don't realize that all of your news stations are handed a script every morning. That's why there's so many compilations all around the entire world where they are all saying the exact same words and they put them together one after the other in a video, right? That's because they're issued what to read. Just like how did, how did in Europe right? How over in, in Britain and UK, did they report the Twin Towers falling before the planes struck the towers? If you haven't heard that, I did a, we did a podcast. There's 126 episodes, Scully and I did, called Pulling the Thread. And it was all about conspiracy theories. 95% of them had a lot of supporting evidence. And there's a lot of trails. They've tried to remove a lot of that from YouTube. But you have other places Rumble and BitChute and uh, Odyssey, where those videos have been put back up. We used to call David Icke, and he still says some crazy shit, um, and Alex Jones, right? We used to make fun of those guys. And the Agenda 21, tinfoil hat, right? We used to do that. We called people that. Except all that Agenda 21 shit, it's now Agenda 20, 30, and 35, and it's every bit of it's come to pass. Every single thing that they put in there as crazy. And Alex Jones... I mean, other than the, the time traveling uh, midget aliens or whatever, and I mean, can you prove that didn't happen, but all the other shit happened. Yep. Yeah, I come <clears throat> from Oregon. I saw Agenda 20, 20 um, happening there. And when I first heard about it, it was probably 2002 or three. Yep. And I could already see what had happened to my state at that point. There's yep. a reason I'm not in Oregon mm-hmm. anymore, more, and it isn't all the weather. When I was on the Benton County uh, Commission, uh, we actually had a commissioner who brought forth a proposal to have uh, zoning, just like you have in a city. He wanted to have zoning countywide. And he actually said, this is part of this agenda. And I'm like, where are you getting that from? And he was on some state level board. And and I he gave me a copy of it. And I was looking through it. I was like, this is agenda 21 shit is are you do you you're telling me the state of tennessee gave you this he's like yeah yeah they're wanting to implement all this in all the counties gradually and i was like gary he's passed on now so i'm gonna use his name i was like why do you want to have city zoning in the county what are you what are you thinking why would you want that and he's like well that way you know if somebody has their yard jumped up you know, then the sheriff can go and make them clean it up. And I'm like, yeah, that's the good part. But think about all the thousands of ways that can be misapplied and abused. What are you thinking about? And I was able to convince the county commission. We got our 12 votes and we shot that in the head. I'm like, hell no, we're not doing that. Uh, if You know, if my neighbor's got a junked up front yard, me and my neighbor will have a conversation. And I'm sure that he will see my, you know, he'll see the logic and he'll clean up his yard. Right, John? Well, I'll, I'll plant bamboo. Um, luckily, your 12 <laughs> councilmen lived out of the city limits, and that wasn't going to happen. It's just like your home security, homeland security guy, right? Every law enforcement agency, to include our little tiny town here, has a homeland security rep. Why? We don't have terrorists here. Yep. You don't have bombs going off. It's not for that. That is not what this is about. How does our, how does our little police department have you know, armored vehicles and MRAPs and Humvees? That's the that's the pipeline. So they do the homeland security stuff. They send them to they learn some good stuff, but it's not to be used against terrorists. That's to be used against those guys that said, no, you're not shutting us down. Yep. And it may or may not be done that way. Okay, I saw this comment here. My my boy had an entire college course on Agenda 21. I I was in college in the 90s. We had a course about city planning where you played Sim City. That's what Sim City is. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. It was that far back. And it's, it's brilliant. Whoever thought to, to gamify it. Right. Because yeah. that makes it me mainstream and it makes people accept it. And it makes it seem normal. Of course you're supposed to plan cities. You're supposed to plan everything in the city. We've got a game about it with ants and. Yep. And having yeah. a, having a five and a 10 year plan works so well. I mean, just look at the old uh, Soviet union, how well it worked there. Sonny, oh, wait, oh, wait a Sonny minute. on here can tell you all about the Soviet Union. It yeah. didn't work so well. Yeah. If, if, it you hasn't at, worked so well. if you look at city planning through like Las Vegas, Los Angeles, San Diego, you used to have sound abatement walls, right? We had these walls that kept cars from coming over and, uh, you know, hitting your house on the side of the uh, freeways, right? And then they got taller. They called them sound abatement walls. Now some of those walls are 20 feet tall. And when you look at them from the air, the walls aren't just down the corridors of the highway. They're around the entire neighborhoods and they have one way in and out. You can literally lock down and control the movement of people. They yep. talk about it in Agenda 21, about sequestering people and pushing people in and making encampments and stuff. It, look at that shit from the air. It looks like there's a reason it looks like it looks and it is what it, you think it is. You know, the funny thing about that is nobody can answer on the environmental side. So this is all done under the guise of saving the earth, right? Yep. For me, nobody's been able to answer the question. If we concentrate everybody in the city, the toxic waste that comes about just from all those people pooping in one place is horrendous. And it's hard to treat like that environmental impact is much worse than if we spread out and are appropriately spread out for the the earth to naturally deal with our waste and you know you ask them that question they're like just because nobody can come up with a real answer for me for that well they don't have a problem with it they want to move everybody from inside the united states to the coast right it's literally like the hunger games push everybody to the coast where you will work entertain educate live within a thousand yards of all those things, right? So so now what do you not need? You don't need a vehicle. And then it gets harder. You're not allowed to leave these areas without passes, right? Well, that's crazy, John. They wouldn't do that. If, if you look at like Epstein Island, right? All the elite people and the rich people all go to one place. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, it's the same puppet show. They all party together no matter what they're leading you to believe, no matter which team you're on. If they took everything and pushed everybody to those coasts, do you think, what do you think would happen next, right? We have too many people on these coasts. They would just, people would just disappear. People would die, whatever happened to them. They don't care because they don't, the laws they pass for you and I, they don't abide by those laws and they will have their playground in the middle. It's just like the inheritance tax stuff right now. You have farms with a thousand acres in the farm that grandpa has. He passes away. They want to assess all the new property. When grandpa dies, they want to assess it at current market value not what he paid for it. So you get some kids who have been farming on these farms their entire life. There's no money in farming. There's not like a big profit. It's literally gambling. You buy insurance to cover your loss in case you lose. And if you make more money, then you don't collect the insurance. That's how farming works. So they want to assess it. And now they want to tax it at 40, 50%, even 60%. Once grandpa dies, these kids, can't, they don't have the money. They have to they sell have the to, farm. They have to sell the farm. Yeah. Or part of the farm. Yep. Yeah. Nobody, nobody. And, and you tell that to people who are all for control and they don't give a shit. I don't care that your livelihood and your family thing went away. That's the whole point. Nobody should be able it's to pass that. Much the, people, on. the people that are for control, you have two kinds of people. You have people that work and create something, have a skill that they're willing to pay for Dr. Barry is my doctor. Like I've gone to him for 15 years. No, he's not my doctor. You're saying uh, he's gone to me. We've gone to him for 15 years, right? We pay for the service. And then you have bureaucrats, people who have a job and are only paid. The only income stream is because they steal and tax and fine people and put people in jail for that. Right. Their job only exists because they steal from other people. And, you, yep. and most times when you use their service, you have to use their service out of legality. You have to go to the IRS. You have to go pay your registration, you know, and that that's what that's what all that shit is. Yeah. OK, we got, we got go ahead. Dr. Definitely Harris. still y'all's doctor, John. I was saying no to nation, not you. Got it. She was like, are you done yet? <laughs> OK, we eat lots of rabbit, pork and eggs. Is there any concern about not eating much beef? And I, yeah, not really. Uh, any meat is better than no meat. 
And so literally uh, rabbit, squirrel, possum, skunk, groundhog, badger, all that's, that's way the hell better than eating processed grains and processed carbs. Uh, but there's something magical about ruminants <clears throat> that are able to eat stuff that we cannot eat and turn it into the most nutritious food that a human being can eat. And then also, as John said earlier, they, they can improve the soil on your farm or your ranch or your land, no matter how big or small it is, they actually improve the soil as they create the most nutritious food a human being can eat. Uh, but no, you, you know, if push comes to shove, you eat any meat you can get your hands on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Is tennis elbow affected by carbs like plantar fasciitis? Yeah. Great. Great question. So plantar fasciitis, iliotibial band, carpal tunnel, de Quervain's tenosynovitis. I could go on and on and on. Any tendonitis or, or uh, connective tissue inflammation is due at least to some degree because of the diet you're eating. Now, you may have had a re re repetitive injury. You may have been playing tennis too much or typing too much or stepped off the porch wrong, but the, the when it becomes chronic, and like, oh, I've had plantar fasciitis for nine months, that's not from an injury. Mm -hmm. That's from your diet. And, and you can go read the comments on my plantar fasciitis video or any of my connective tissue videos and read the comments. People will be like, I saw this video a year ago and I thought you were full of shit. And I just came back to this video. My plantar fasciitis since I started a proper human diet has gone or keto, or carnivore, or my carpal tunnel's gone, my dequer veins is gone, my ileal tibial band, just on and on and on. It's gone. You were right. Oh, my God, I can't believe you were right. I thought you were so full of shit when I first saw this video. But they'll come back a year later and comment like, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think when we get miserable, we get to a point where we are willing to try anything, right? Yep. Even something crazy like changing our diet to control right. our health. Right. Hey, we'll real, real quick, guys. We've got yeah. 95 people on here and there's only 38 hearts and thumbs up. Can you guys up click, that? click that like button? It doesn't cost you anything to do it. And it's two inches away from where your thumbs are right now. Yep. Can you raise yep. that number up for us? Yep. It makes a difference in the algorithm. And it's good exercise too. Oh, we got some. It's going up now. Thoughts on being prescribed metformin to treat type 2 diabetes when first diagnosed? Yeah, metformin is the least bad of all the type 2 diabetes medications, and it's it's going to provide more benefit to you as a type 2 or a pre-diabetic than uh, harm. So that's the, the only type 2 medication that I recommend that you take until you have reversed your type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes by eating a proper human diet. And so when your hemoglobin A1C is 5.6 or less, then you can throw the metformin in the garbage. But if your A1C is above 5.6, keep taking the metformin because it is helping you with your insulin and glucose metabolism, but you're not going to need it forever. You're just going to need it until you have fixed the type 2 diabetes with diet because metformin will never fix it. It will just help you cope with it. Is metformin, does it have to be refrigerated? No. Okay. It does yeah. need to be room temperature, but not refrigerated. This one goes back to losing the farm. I methodically put land and homes in my four kids' names throughout the time. We can gift kids $15,000 per year legally. I've been doing it for 30 years now times four kids. You Excellent. can also employ your kids. Yep, you, you can employ your kids. Yeah. Yep, I think the, the federal case was tried at five years of age. The last time I was all up in the, so when your kid's five years old, you can start paying them $100 a week to empty, empty garbage cans. And that case has actually been tried in the tax courts. And that person won. And that's why uh, Sandy Botkin usually has the best books about how to get all the tax deductions. And he will cite the case where that was decided in the in the tax courts. And, and I was, I remember in the clinic, uh, John, I, when I read Botkin's book back in, I don't know, 2000, and I'm like, oh, my God, I've got a bunch of kids. They can all empty the garbage cans. And so that that helped a lot. Uh, what Nisha and I are probably going to do is we're going to probably start a trust or a foundation because I don't trust young adult humans. They make dumb decisions. And so rather than give them land, we're probably going to have a trust, and then they'll have access to use the farmland and stuff, but they'll never be able to F it up. 
Like, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, John, but when I was 20, oh, son, I was world class at making bad decisions. I still do. I know. I'm li- The reason I'm smirking is like, what, young, what are you talking about? Yeah, I'm sure I made a bad decision last week. Business advice. Exactly. Um, like Spirico likes to say, 80, 88,000 pages is the IRS tax code. 8,000 is what we have to do. 80,000 pages is how not to do it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, John, this one's for you. What's the company you do not recommend regarding the fuel latch issue? So custom <laughs> fab. The problem with the he's talking about swing out tailgates. I've got a tire on one side, fuel cans yeah. on the other on the forerunner. The Victory Off-Road made the ones I'm using. I like them. The latch assembly has an issue that has failed three times. They don't manufacture the latch. They just wouldn't hook up the latch. They wouldn't give me a source for it. So we actually fixed it on our own. I'll talk to you about that on, on the side. Anybody with Toyotas um, wants any of that stuff, you cannot go wrong with Rago Manufacturing. Awesome. Dr. Barry, how are we doing on time? We're a little over what you let's were do. Expecting. Let's do one more good question, Nicole, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow out. I hate to leave this good conversation. Um, yeah. Well, how about this? Tell us, like, your main – most important thing we need to walk away with this from tell us how we can connect with you on the web on social on youtube all those things so the main take-home message is there is a proper human diet number one number two your doctor is probably not currently recommending that nor is your dietitian nor is the american diabetes association or the american heart association all of these entities have basically been captured by the big food corporations and by the big pharma corporations to the point where their their message to you has been polluted. You cannot blindly trust nutrition advice from your doctor or dietitian anymore. Very often the school that they were educated at was paid for by big food or big pharma money. And you think, well, that doesn't matter. Oh, 100 percent. We're all human beings. I tell people all the time, doctors are just dudes and chicks. Just like all the rest of us, they are, they are no, no way morally or ethically more gifted. That's horseshit. We are just dudes and chicks. We are uh, susceptible to all of the temptation that everybody else is. We're just as fallible. We, may, we say dumb shit every day. I wrote a book called Lies My Doctor Told Me that, that is going to help you understand a lot of the kind of the, the foundational misinformation you get from your doctor that's available wherever books are sold and it's also there's an audible if you have add like i think all three of us do you can (laughs) listen to it on audible while you do something else uh i've got a youtube channel that has 1.9 million subscribers uh and i've got over 500 videos that will help you understand all this i'm talking about so you can go to youtube and just search dr barry high blood pressure, Dr. Barry diabetes, Dr. Barry uh, sprained ankle. Literally, I've got a video on over 500 different topics that's going to help you understand what your doctor's telling you that's incorrect. And then also the correct information you can actually apply to your life and the life of your family. And I'm, I'm, on, I'm on all social media. I'm on all of it because I'm like a bank robber goes where the money is. I have to go where the people are if I'm going to help people get healthier. And so I'm, I I don't know if there's a social media that I'm not on. Uh, And so if you're like, Oh, I bet he's not on rumble. Yeah, I am. I bet he's not on Odyssey. Yeah, I am. Gab, me, we, uh, TikTok, uh, Vero. You ever heard of Vero? I'm on Vero because there's people there. So uh, yeah, look for me on your social media. That's your favorite. I'm probably there. And if not, let him know. He might want to be there. That's right. All right. So where are you going to be June 11th? I'm going to be in, where am I going to be, Nicole? Tell me. Camden, Tennessee, Self-Reliance Festival. That's right. That's right. And also my website, Nisha says, drberry.com. I've got to tell you my website. Yep. Doctor, I'm writing it right now. Drberry.com. So we did did, um, launch ticket sales for Early Bird at the event last weekend for Self-Reliance Festival at selfrelianceFestival.com. After April 1st, those tickets go up in price. Do connect with Dr. Barry at drberry.com. We can find that that supplement there too, right? Yep, that's exactly right. And then Paintball Realtree, your gout has nothing to do with eating meat. I've got videos about that. If any of you guys have kidney stones, that has nothing to do with eating meat. I've got a video about that. 
your diverticulitis we discussed earlier has nothing to do with eating meat. I've got a video about that. Awesome. John, any last words before we sign off? I do a live feed every night at nine o'clock on Special Operations Equipment YouTube page, seven days a week. If you want to continue these conversations, these are the conversations we have. Awesome. Thanks, guys. If you want to follow me, go to livingfreeintennessee.com. I do a podcast on building the life you choose on your terms. Thanks for joining in today. Talk to everybody later.